This content is brought to you by Uphold, which is a great platform that makes it easy and simple for you to buy, hold, and sell and earn crypto. You can trade from anything to anything. For example, you can trade between cryptocurrencies and precious metals. It's an amazing platform that I've been using for years. And in fact, I still use to this day because they're one, a great exchange, um, they're reputable, and they're one of the only exchanges that still lists XRP. Many Many of the other exchanges have delisted XRP due to the SEC lawsuit, but you can still get XRP on Uphold. So I have interviewed the CEO, the founder, and many other representatives from Uphold over the years, and I'm a fan of this platform. And once again, there's some great features like trading between different assets very easily. You don't have to convert to a currency and so forth. They're used by 10 plus million users. They have over 200 cryptocurrencies. And they have a very easy to use app. Uh, the interface is really nice. So I can certainly vouch for this platform. Once again, I've been a user for years. So if you'd like to learn more about Uphold, please visit the link in the description. Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is Commissioner Hester Peirce of the SEC. Hester is no stranger to the show. Uh, it's great to have you back on the show, Commissioner Peirce. Tony, it's great to be back, as you know, and as your listeners know, my views are my own views, not necessarily those of the SEC or my fellow commissioners. And I'm going to just add a little disclaimer here. Um, I, I will not be able to address any particular companies, tokens, litigation, <laughs> investigations, rumors of investigations. Um, so that, those are kind of the ground rules going in. Sure. And certainly understand that given uh, your position as part of a regulatory body. Um, and speaking of regulations, I would love to start with, you know, have there been any new discussions within the SEC about updating the Howey test, given that digital assets and cryptocurrencies are such a new disruptive technology? You know, I, I can't imagine the folks back in 1930 something or 40 something when you know, the Howey situation was happening, was thinking of global, globally distributed networks and things along those lines. And has there been any consideration to your safe harbor proposals? Well, since we last talked, there's been a lot, obviously, that's happened in crypto and in Washington. And, and I think the two interact with one another. And so there, there's a lot of talk in Washington in general about what's the appropriate regulatory framework. Um, and, and so I think that has meant that topics like my safe harbor have come up. Um, and certainly I talk to anyone and everyone who will listen to me about my safe harbor. I think it's still a, a, a viable road forward because it would allow people who are buying tokens to get information about the token and the team that launched it and the plans for you know its development and so forth. Um, and, and so I think it would be quite useful in that regard. And so I continue to, to, to argue that it would be Useful. An another important development is that, so as, as, your, as your listeners know, we have a five-member commission, and recently two new members came on to the commission, two uh, left and two new ones came on. And so now um, those two commissioners will have to think about these issues as well and come to their own conclusions. Um, so certainly, um, I, I hope to, uh, to continue to be able to, to ask um, my agency to, to think about a safe harbor. Congress has also thought about something like a safe harbor. Mm -hmm. um, but that all that optimistic uh, sentiment, I also have to acknowledge that the safe harbor is not on our regulatory agenda, which is, which is the document that comes out that lays out what rules the SEC is considering um, and will be working on. So I don't see the safe harbor on that agenda. Hmm. Um, has Chairman Genser and yourself and the other commissioners talked about the safe harbor and maybe if it's not your safe harbor, other options Has Chairman Genser maybe brought something to the table saying, this is how I think it should it should be? Well, I think Chair Gensler has has spoken quite publicly about the way that he looks at this space and the way that um, he thinks about it. So I, I do urge people to to go and watch. And I know Probably a lot of the people um, listening today have already heard his statements, but so he's been pretty public about it. Um, one of my colleagues, Commissioner Crenshaw, actually responded publicly 
to the idea of a safe harbor, um, suggesting that that wasn't her preferred approach. She gave a she gave a speech, which is again I commend it to people's reading, and she's she's done some writing in this area as well. So, you know, there there is a pretty public conversation about these things. It, I, we've talked before about the Sunshine Act and about how the five of us can't actually get together and talk about policy. Um, we can't do that behind closed doors. We either do that in public or we, we talk one-on-one -on -one with each other, but we can't, we can't have those five member conversations um, privately, which does kind of change the way regulatory policy gets made, right? If you can't all sit in a room together and hash things out, there are obviously good reasons for that kind of a policy, but it does change the, the, the way debates happen. That is very interesting. I did not know that, that the, the commissioners cannot meet in a room and discuss things. It's that is. Uh, so uh, we can, we can, if the, you know, if it's a, an open meeting, we're considering a rule, the public's watching, or we can, if we're talking in a closed room, in a closed meeting about an enforcement action, mm -hmm. but we have to limit our conversation to the enforcement action. So it's, it's, again, it's a transparency law. Um, and it does allow us to have these kind of conversations very publicly, which I think is 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 not a bad thing so that the public can kind of see, oh, Hester's out there talking about her safe harbor. Another commissioner is responding or, or presenting her own ideas. Um, Chair Gensler is suggesting that, you know, he, this is what he thinks about the space. So that can be kind of healthy, but it can also mean that you don't have the, you know, real knock down drag out arguments in the in the in the back room and then hashing out a policy as a result of that. Hmm. Now, you mentioned Congress and we know Congress makes the laws. So uh, and, and we may have touched on this in the previous interviews. Could Congress, let's say next month, as a, uh, an example, come out and say, SEC, Chairman Genser and team, please use this new rules, uh, a set of rules to regulate the crypto market. Is that a, a, a realistic scenario? Well, it's absolutely realistic that Congress could do something like that. I think you're, you're within a month is not very realistic in part because Congress typically during August is, is in recess. They're back, uh, they're back so-called recess. They're back at home. Um, so, so it's unlikely that it would happen in that time frame, but certainly could happen. And I think there's been more and more focus in Congress. That's one of the positive things. I mean, sometimes when I look back over the last four years, I get discouraged because it doesn't seem that we've made a lot of forward progress. But the fact that these conversations are happening much more frequently, and I think with much more granularity in um in Congress um, and in regulatory agencies, I think that will lead to some sort of a regulatory framework that um, could help all of us figure out what the way forward is. What, what did you? What were your thoughts on the Senator Lummis and Gillibrand bill? Was was that something that you're in favor of? Well, so what I what I really I typically don't comment on legislation either, pending legislation, except that I will say that that what, what was really positive about that effort, it, it was a bipartisan, holistic effort to address a lot of different issues in crypto. Um, they put it out there with the idea that people would comment and respond. And um, so I think that having those kinds of pieces of legislation draft legislation out there can be really excellent for focusing conversations focusing people's thinking um and i think you've seen a lot of great discussion prompted by that uh by that bill yeah i think it's really great that we're seeing bipartisan support democrats and republicans coming together and they don't <laughs> it's funny you know government sometimes they don't, they can't work together they can't agree on things but it's great to see you know the bipartisan well and these issues don't shouldn't B, I mean, it's a question of what regulatory framework do we want for crypto, right? That doesn't that doesn't need to be a, a partisan issue. That's something that that we can we just need to think about it pragmatically. I think. Hmm. Um. The the other item I wanted to ask you is is you and uh, Commissioner Caroline Pham of of uh, the CFTC. Um. You recently spoke together 
about crypto regulations. And I, I would love to get you know your thoughts on what's the ideal scenario and balance of power, if you want to call it that, between the CFTC and the SEC. And are you two working on any initiatives together? Well, the ideal scenario is the one that Congress decides is ideal uh, because they're the ones who are, who are, it's certainly their decision to make. Um, but Commissioner Pham, who started relatively recently at the CFTC, has taken a real interest in crypto. She's very knowledgeable about both traditional finance and about um, digital assets. And she's really put a lot of thought into what some of the issues are that we need to, to deal with and, and what potential solutions could be. So she and I called for joint roundtables between the two agencies. We're both commissioners. We're not the chairs of our agency, so we can't we can't make that happen necessarily, um, but we do talk frequently, um, and and we're we're thinking about you know we would love to uh, to to try to do as much we as we can together, whether that's talking to market participants together. She runs an advisory committee over there at the CFTC, and I'm sure she'll use that um, for for lots of things. But I would imagine that crypto might be one of them. Sure. And again, I don't speak for her either, but but um, she you know she's really been very active in this space. I, I'm uh, s- scheduled to speak to her within a month's time, so I'll, I'll definitely be you asking can ask her. her those questions. Yeah. Um, question for you, you know, maybe you can take us beyond the curtain a bit. You, you know, have members of Congress reached out to you to get like your thoughts on how the SEC should do things, regulate things? Uh, I don't know if you can tell us about that or, or conversations. Yeah, but- no, I can't really talk about those conversations, but I think it's you know, you see that that very public conversation in Washington with a lot of people throwing ideas in. And so I'm learning from what they say. I, you know, I, I would imagine sometimes they see what I say. And it's 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 I think a very healthy dynamic in terms of, of really the issues being being much more front and center now. Hmm. Um, I wanted to ask you about Coinbase because there have been some public comments from Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong uh, stating the SEC has been acting sketchy lately, things along those lines. We've heard that uh, the SEC, and, and this is hasn't been confirmed by the SEC folks, that's why I'm asking you, um, to block lo- uh, Coinbase lending. And then you're also reviewing Coinbase staking. Can you tell us about that? What's happening here and why the SEC is reviewing staking and lending and so forth? Well, so as I said, I can't speak to any particular company and, and certainly can't speak about any um, investigation or rumors of investigation and so forth. And what I will say is that um, all of these issues, you know, I always tell people you should think about the securities laws implications of what you're doing, because this, the reach of the securities laws is, is quite is quite broad. And so you need to be thinking about that um, as you're as you're figuring out what products and services you might offer um, with respect to securities lend uh, crypto lending specifically, we did bring an action against BlockFi and that was a settled action. And so I was able to put out a statement about that. And as I said, even if you decide that this is a, a, a well within the securities laws, which a lot of a lot of securities lawyers looked at crypto lending and they said, yes, that's well within the securities laws, that's a securities product. What my response is, okay, then let's think about what is the right regulatory framework for that? Where can we get the the the, the right result for retail participants in those programs? You know, clearly they want to have some information about how the how the product works, what the risks involved are. And the securities laws are one way to get people that kind of information. But in that BlockFi settlement, we also included sort of there's a there's an Investment Company Act component to it. And my response to that was, I'm not really sure I see that that adds anything to the mix in terms of, of the, the regulatory framework. And we, you know, we want to see at the end of the day, a regulatory framework that is workable. Um, and so it remains to be seen how that will all will all play out. But I think it really is important for us to keep our eye on what the ultimate objective is, as opposed to just keeping our eye on, you know, trying to jam something into a framework that we're, you know, used to using in other in other 
parts of what we do. I think it goes back to Tony, to what you said at the beginning, which is, you know, a lot of these laws were developed a long time ago. They were developed in a way that was intended to be quite flexible and to deal with new facts and circumstances, new products and services. We have actually quite broad authority to give people exemptions. And that doesn't mean that you get a full exemption from all the securities laws. What it means is you can come in, we can help you craft a framework that will meet our regulatory objectives, but will also allow you to offer a product and service that people want. Um, and so I've been arguing that we should really be much more out front in using and offering to use that exemptive power that we have, it allows for experimentation in an iterative way and in a way that people, it's not, I, I worry when we craft these kinds of deals in, in the context of an enforcement action, because that means it's a, it's a conversation between the one company and the, the SEC's enforcement lawyers, instead of having it be a conversation that's through you know, a more public format where someone then can come in and iterate off that that exemption that was given to one company and say, hey, we want to do it slightly differently. Will this work? So we have the tools. We're just not using them. Mm, yeah, that's, that's a great point. Um, and look, I and I think I speak for a lot of listeners. I think folks want the SEC to do their job and weed out scams. There are scams in the crypto. Market. There are scams. Yes. But we, I think folks are frustrated because they're like, there are legitimate companies that are building really great products and real world use case uh, services and solutions and so forth. And it's like, why is the SEC targeting those folks? Um, yes, you can check in. Yes, you can make sure their books are in order. And, and look, I just look at Celsius and I'm like, well, that really sucks. Uh, what happened with Celsius Network? Um, <clears throat> not ideal. But I, I, I think folks are just frustrated by the 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 enforcement actions and and sometimes there's not uh the clarity or the transparency as to okay well why is it because they were an easy target for the sec uh because i can list like 10 scams that i see on the market right now and I'm like why is the sec not going after them and uh, well, maybe... one i hope you tell us about those scams so we have a whistleblower program i'm putting a plug in for that you can go to our website and actually file a whistleblower complaint and if we bring an action and and there is money that we collect based on that, you can you can actually get an, a whistleblower's award. So I put a plug in for that. But you know, I've been pretty outspoken about my concern about the fact that we've taken a regulation by enforcement approach in this area, especially because I think there's some discrete areas where we could have provided guidance. Um, we could have done some rulemaking if that needed um, to be the approach, or we could have used these exemptive applications and no action letters um, also. So we had options, and I think we we just haven't taken full advantage of those options. Mm. Um, I wanted to ask I mean, you as you say, too, on the fraud on the fraud point, I mean, we have brought brought actions against crypto frauds. It is a very important use of our resources, I think, to go after those crypto frauds. And I don't think anyone would disagree with us yeah. using our resources for that. So so I tend to agree with you that that they're they're um, you know, that's that's a good use of of our time and our energy. And I, I hope we'll continue to bring those kind of cases. For sure. Um recently the the SEC argued um that the following are irrelevant to whether a token is a security. And I want to get your thoughts on it. First the utility of a token, two, the intent of purchasers, uh, three, ongoing technical work, um, and four, marketing statements. Do you agree with, with all of these? So look, any analysis of anything, whether it's a security or not, is going to be a facts and circumstances analysis. But you and I have talked about before how my approach to thinking about these things is a little bit different than um, the way we've approached them so far. And I think we have to also bear in mind you know, that the Howey test is out there and, and it's been applied to lots of different things over time. Um, but we, we do have to make sure that the way we're applying the test makes sense when you take a step back and look at it. So I'm not going to talk about specific facts and circumstances, but I will say that I want us to take an approach that makes sense. And I want us to think if we're 
if we're labeling something to be a security, what does that mean down the line for how that thing trades, where it trades, and so forth? And there's some really difficult questions there that we just haven't grappled with. Yeah, you know, something that just popped into my head, uh, given that this is a global asset class and there are exchanges in other countries and everything's on the blockchain, you know, it, let's say the SEC takes this hard stance and they start going after a lot of these uh, the different tokens and so forth. What's stopping people from using a VPN and just going and trading it on an external exchange and so forth? It would seem that that would be what more a lot of people might do. And I think some of them are already doing. Um, is the SEC aware of that, that people can, these markets exist outside of the United States and we can just do that? Yeah, I mean, the SEC is not, not um, new to the idea that markets are international, right? There are a lot of markets that we deal with that are very international. So that isn't a new thing. But, you know, the point that you raise is a good one, right? We can make decisions about we're trying to protect U.S. investors and uh, U.S. retail people. We want to make sure that they're, they're safe and protected. Um, but sometimes I think we do lose sight of the bigger picture that you know, maybe we'd rather have them trading on U.S. in the U.S. on U.S. entities. Um, and maybe we decide we want to have some regulatory framework for U.S. entities. A lot of people are talking about a potential regulatory framework for trading platforms at the federal level. Um, but that might be a better result than than forcing, essentially forcing people or saying, if you want to if you want to be involved in this market, you have to go overseas to be involved in it. So I think that's a that's a fair um, part of the conversation, a fair consideration for us to be thinking about and for you to be raising. Yeah, because look, I, I I've heard of people even um, putting their money into stable coins, sending it to a family member in another country. They're trading it there, doing different things that they these folks don't have access to in the United States, and that's how they're making their money. So the capital is leaving the United States. Uh, yeah, some of it's coming back in, but. These are the things that are happening. Some people are using well, and, and also, you know, when you add steps like that to the to the system, it makes everything more complicated. So again, I think we need to, as a securities regulator, not just related to crypto, we need to think about investor protection not only as protecting people um, from fraud, but also protecting people's ability to participate in things they would like to participate in but also making sure that they're getting the right kinds of disclosures about risks um, and about, about potential for loss, which they really do need to be thinking about, obviously, and, and, and protection from bad actors and so forth. For sure. Um, let's talk about Bitcoin spot ETF. <laughs> um, I, I know we've spoken about this, and I'm curious if there are any updates as to why has there not been a Bitcoin spot ETF approved yet? Uh, it, maybe you can take us beyond the curtain. What is Chairman Genser saying? What is the holdup? What, what is the concern for, for, for that? Well, look, I gave a speech not that I think earlier this summer, um, and uh, and and I said I'm really surprised um, if you had told me four years ago that a that a Bitcoin exchange traded product wouldn't be approved. Um, I would have been very surprised. Now, we obviously do have futures-based products that have been approved. And so that's a step forward. But I think a lot of people are still out there waiting for the spot product, which is really a different product than the futures-based product. Um, facts and circumstances matter. But what I think um, has been troubling to me is that it seems like a bit of a moving target in terms of what the approval standards are. There's this there's this look for uh, the the disapproval orders are actually quite lengthy. And so you can take a look and you can see what they're pointing to. But one of the things they're looking for is a, is a regulated market where, where Bitcoin trades. Um, we have the regulated futures market, which the CFTC regulates. And so um, I think one could argue that because the spot and futures markets are tied together, you could look at that regulated market my concern is that I don't want this to be the kind of thing where we're waiting to approve a Bitcoin exchange traded product, a spot product, until we until we have all of the exchanges registered and regulated by us. Yeah. Um, I hope that that's not what's going on. But I, I, you know, as I said in that speech, and I, I 
commend your listeners to to look at that speech. Um, I'm still a bit mystified by where, why we are where we are. Now, I had interviewed uh, former SEC Commissioner Joseph Grunfest um, earlier this year, and you know it's, it's, he made a statement that the applicants can sue the SEC for denial of, of the spot ETF applications. And lo and behold, uh, Grayscale got their uh, application denied, and now they're suing the SEC. You know, what are your thoughts on this? And it, it, you know, could there be a flood of lawsuits coming the SEC's way as a result, given that there are multiple applicants? I can't speak to litigation. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, I did want to get your thoughts on BlackRock's launch. If, if you're aware of the details on this, um, they launched a Bitcoin spot trust, and having these institutions of this caliber and size launching such products, could that be a catalyst to help get a spot ETF approved? I think there's been widespread institutional interest in a spot product for a long time. And again, I find it remarkable that in 2018, we were, I, I already thought in 2018, we could have approved a, a spot product. And here we are, 2022 is drawing to a close and we still don't have a product. We've seen a lot of institutional interest in the interim. I, you know, I just, I continue to be frustrated by, by where we are. And again, facts and circumstances matter. You always have to look into the facts and circumstances. A lot of the different applicants that have come in, you know, they all take a slightly different approach and that, that matters, right? But in general, I, I continue to, to not understand why we are where we are. Yeah, because I was surprised that you know the folks like Van Eck, who've been I mean, been around for a while, even uh, Bitwise and so forth, were getting theirs rejected, and I'm sure they know what they're doing. But like you said, facts and circumstances matter. Well, I think one of the things that's that's been a bit puzzling to me is that I I it does seem like we're sometimes dealing with crypto specific standards, which mm. are different than the standards that are applied in other uh, in other places. Sure. That makes sense. Um, so Hester, I have to ask you some questions around Ethereum and one of your former colleagues, um, Bill Hinman, and this may be awkward, but I have to ask because there has been uh, certain information released through the Ripple case, even FOIA requests from Empower Oversight, which is a whistleblower, nonprofit whistleblower organization. So uh, there are sayings that the ethics department in uh, the SEC warned Bill Hinman about conversations with Simpson Thatcher, who is part of the Ethereum Alliance. Uh, Bill Hinman gave a speech about Ethereum saying it's not a security. Jay Clayton, Commissioner Jackson, a bunch of folks endorsed that speech uh, and have publicly referenced it as a kind of a standard. I, I want to, if I don't know what you can say about this, but I want to get your thoughts and the public is is feeling a lack of confidence in the SEC as, as a result of these uh, details. So FOIA requests come in all the time and they're they're handled. We have rules and processes around the way they're handled. And and so that, um, you know, these FOIA requests you're talking about will be handled according to those same rules and processes. And and uh, and that's typically how you know, how people can get information about what agencies are doing. They use FOIA requests all the time. Are you able to comment on any of the potential ethics concerns and potential conflicts of interest around? Uh... I can't comment. Okay. Um, Chairman Genser, um, unlike his colleagues, uh, Jay Clayton and, and Bill Hinman, um, has not spoken about Ethereum, even though Bill Hinman and Jay Clayton have talked about Ethereum. And he just primarily talks about Bitcoin. Are, are you folks at the SEC going to be reviewing Ethereum's ICO? Um, because folks are wondering, is there a double standard here? What, why did Ethereum kind of get uh, a clearance, so to speak, and the other projects are getting, you know, have targets on their back? So Tony, you and I both read Twitter, um, and and so you know I just I can't talk about potential investigations, rumors of investigations, particular tokens, particular companies. I just can't talk about any of those kinds of things. 
Um, some folks have asked me to check with you, and this is an awkward question to ask. Um, to uh, is there anything that you're aware of uh, that happened with the SEC that you could be a whistleblower to? I just can't comment on that question. Esther, I was curious if you are able to speak to this aspect of what's happening with the Ripple lawsuit, and that is XRP holders um, aligning with attorney John Deaton, who's been giving a MISI status, if I'm saying that right. Uh, what are your thoughts on that and that dynamic? And and let's say it's not even Ripple, but it's, it's you know certain folks who are behind certain stocks and other cryptos crowdsourcing and almost coming against the SEC in a way. Uh, are you able to speak to that in any any way? No, I mean, I really can't speak to it. And, and ultimately, those kinds of decisions about amici status are, are decisions that the court makes based on the facts and circumstances of a particular case. Um, okay, so let's say, let's remove Ripple or Ethereum and, and all these other, other way. Let's say it's two years from now. Um, I don't know, maybe it's AMC stock or some other stock. People are investing in it. In it. They're upset about something the SEC is doing. And there's 100,000 people, you know, crowdsourcing against the SEC. Is the SEC aware of this dynamic and this new world that we live in in social media? And, and how are you playing to handle things like that? No, absolutely. Um, we're aware of, of the new dynamic um, and you know, the, there are many instances where people are able to talk to each other and communicate with each other now that just weren't available even 10 years ago. Um, and so it certainly has allowed people to have conversations about shared interests, whether that's interest in a litigation or interest in a in an asset class um, and and that we're aware of it. Um, we think about that kind of thing, too, in in. You know, as with every every other technological development, it affects the way we think about regulation and it affects the way um, we think about protecting investors. Um, what can crypto investors, enthusiasts, people a part of the industry do to support you and the safe harbor and to help get clear regulations? Um, and I know we've probably talked about this, but I want to make sure, you know, for the new listeners that they feel empowered and they know what, as far as a call to action and next steps of what to do. Well, you know, I think I and my colleagues all have open doors. We can't, as, as I've reiterated many times, we can't talk about specific litigation and, and so, or specific investigations, rumors of investigations, so forth. But if you come in with a, you know, a, a, a clear, suggestion around regulation. These are the kinds of things that, that we like to talk to people about. So um, that's that's probably the best way to, to engage um, with us as an agency. You know, you might want to come in with a with a group to talk about some of these issues, but but um, you know, my door is open again. If you come in and you tell me you want to talk about a particular case, I'm not going to be able to engage, and 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 I apologize, but that's just the way it is. But um, but more generally, I'm I'm always interested to hearing from people, to hear from people. For sure. Um, final questions here on, on the uh, markets and regulations. What were your thoughts on President Biden's crypto executive order, um, which is seemed to be a call to action to different regulatory agencies and bodies? Uh, do you see it as something good? I think majority of people do, and and uh, you know, potentially what the outcomes may be. Yeah, I mean, on the positive side, I think it did uh, coalesce um, or or bring bring regulators together to 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 realize, okay, we need to think about crypto. It's it is here to stay, and so it it I think is is requiring a number of agencies to do work on on crypto and thinking about what's the right regulatory approach and so forth. So I think that's positive. I'm certainly not involved in in um, drafting reports. The SEC has some role to play, but that's that's not my role. Um, the, on the on the 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 negative side, um, I think that there was a lot of emphasis around central bank digital currencies. Um, that's one aspect of digital assets that people talk about. 
I think there's a lot of exciting stuff happening in the private on the private side. Um, so I, I hope that the 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 interest doesn't all shift to the CBDC side. But um, but again, I think it's that the the executive order has been part of the broader um, shift that we've talked about throughout this conversation um, to really shift people's focus to think about crypto, to think about some discrete questions around regulating crypto. And I think that's by and large positive. Yeah, at least a, a move in the right direction. Um, you know, you mentioned CBDCs, um, and I don't know if this is something you can speak to, but, you know, I've been asking different folks, Chris Giancarlo, uh, Congressman Tom Emmer, and so forth. Will the digital dollar maintain our right to privacy uh, and the U.S. Constitution? And I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but it's well, something so that I'm, I'm concerned about. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit outside my purview, but I think the question is a very important question. And I think financial privacy questions are ones that we really need to spend time thinking together as a society about because, um, you know, as technology changes, it becomes easier to track what everyone does in the financial markets. And people do have an interest in, in financial privacy. We have other interests as a society also. Um, interest about protecting our nation and so forth. But we we do need to remember that financial privacy is is very important and we have to figure out ways to protect it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, wrap up question here for you. Fun one. Uh, if you could create your own metaverse, what would the theme be? I mean, I think the theme would be liberty, which is people are able to make decisions for themselves and and you know bear responsibility for those but also the golden rule which is don't don't do to others what you wouldn't have them do to you so i'd like to have that balance in my metaverse <laughs> awesome hester uh always a pleasure chatting with you thank you so much for joining me today and i appreciate you taking the time to answer these questions and uh you know your continued fight for uh clear regulations and clarity for the market thanks tony i always enjoy our conversations Thank you.